Okay, so this particular class is focused on chapter one, learning objective one, which discusses the forms of business organization and the uses of accounting information. Okay. All right, so let's say you wanted to start a business. Uh, there are some choices. These are the three basic forms um, in which you get to choose from. Okay. The, uh, the forms of business are legally recognized, you know, businesses. That's basically why we have forms. These are legally recognized. So you could be recognized as a sole proprietorship. Um, sole proprietorship is one owner. That's the word sole in front of it here. So a sole proprietorship, it's a business that's owned and operated by one person. By uh, nature, it is the simplest to establish. Okay, because I could be out with a couple of buddies and decide, you know, I'm this teaching gig. I've been doing it for 26 years. Uh, what I really want to do is just, you know, strap a plow on the front of my Honda Civic and start plowing snow, uh, you know, uh, this, this winter and have my own little business. And they might say, yeah, that's great. That's great. Pour me another drink. Um, so it's really that simple. If there's no legal requirements that I be licensed to do it, I can start it just as simple. I can start cleaning houses. There's no legal requirement that I be certified in cleaning houses. I can start cleaning houses or walking dogs or things like that. It's really that simple to start. Um, however, some businesses, even if you want to do it by yourself, might require uh, government um, approval, for example, a licensure. So I can't be a barber or a cosmetologist because those are licensed professions. I have to actually get my license first. I can't be a massage therapist or uh, things like this. I need some type of a license to do certain things. And so uh, daycare as well. It's easy to say, oh, I can babysit, I can day do daycare. Well, you know, it's a little bit more complicated legally than that. And so if there's licenses that are involved, you have to make sure you have the appropriate licenses. Um, restaurant, a lot of people want to start a restaurant as a business. Yeah, that's a great idea. Of course, not today, because no one's going to show up unless it's outside. Um, and, you know, basically speaking, you know, you're going to need a lot of permits. <laughs> you know, uh, health inspection and making sure uh, food and other sanitation is correctly stored and cleaned and so forth. There's a lot of codes, health and other codes that you need to make sure you get approved for. And that can delay the opening of a business like that. But like I said, some businesses are very simple. I can start tomorrow. I mean, if it's, of course, it's not going to be snowing in August, uh, although with climate change, we'll never know. Someday it might. Um, you know, I could put a plow on my car and, and start plowing snow someday and, and there's no, you know, no stopping me. Um, clean houses or walk dogs as well. So it can be that simple, in other words. It's owner controlled because you are the owner and the manager. So whatever you say goes, you own it. Um, whoever owns it basically says what's going on. Uh, the other thing too about owner controlled is if it's a profitable business, it's all yours. You don't have to mostly, share it. Mostly. Do I have a question? No, it's just mostly you mostly get money. It's mostly money. Okay. Yes. Well, certainly that's uh, the goal of, uh, of having a business is to make a living, make money. Um, and of course, if you are profitable, uh, the wonderful thing about a sole proprietorship is you are taxed as a person, as an individual. So the individual tax rates uh, apply to your business because there's no difference between you, the person, and you, the business, in a sole proprietor. Uh, tax rates for individuals start at 10% um, and go up from there. Is that right, Jeanette? I have a tax specialist in the class, so I can check with her. Is that correct? I'm sorry, what was the question? And 10% and up for individual tax rates? Yes. Yes, 10% and up. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Um, well, uh, do I have to, if I'm all alone, do I have to be a sole proprietor? No, you don't. You can't be a partnership because you need two or more, but you can actually incorporate. You can incorporate 
So if I want it to be, you know, Mike the Dog Walker Incorporated, uh, I can go ahead and incorporate my business. Now, forming a corporation is the responsibility of the states. Every state decides how you become uh, a corporation. Uh, there's an application process with fees, of course, and um, the state will review all the legal requirements. And once they approve your application, then uh, that business that you wanted becomes a legal entity. It's a really, it's almost like an artificial person, artificial being in the eyes of the law. The corporation in and of itself exists separate from you. So even though I'm Mike the dog walker, uh, Mike Arujo, the person, is separate from Mike Arujo, the president of the dog walk, you know, of this dog walking company. Um, it's a separate entity. My dog walking company can get sued, but my personal stuff is safe. Okay. That's not true with the sole proprietorship because there's no difference legally between Mike the dog walker and Mike the person, okay? No difference legally. But in a corporation, that corporation actually establishes a separate legal entity for its own business, okay? And that is an advantage because in that sense, you know, my personal liability is very, very limited to whatever I've invested in the corporation, okay? Uh, the worst case scenario if my corporation goes out of business the most I can lose is whatever I've invested in it. Okay. That's not the case with a sole proprietorship uh, because it's not specific to the business because there's no difference legally between me, the business and me, the person. And so everything about me, business and non-business is up for grabs in a major lawsuit. Okay. So there's a lot of liability when it comes to a sole proprietorship compared to corporation. Do I have a question? No, okay. Um, one thing that's uh, really interesting too, and I'll get back to the corporation in a minute. A lot of people like to go ahead and, um, and not go into business with somebody else or in a couple of cases, more than one other person. Uh, a partnership is a, a business that's formed with two or more people. So it could be two people, uh, it could be 22 people, it could be 222 people. There's no limit to the number of partners that you can have in a partnership. Um, but uh, it is a form of business that very much like the sole proprietorship is relatively simple to establish and has the same tax advantages because you are still a person, even though you're part of a partnership, you are looked upon legally uh, as the person. Okay. Now that has its own issues with liability because in certain partnerships, in a general partnership, uh, you and your partner are still legally liable for anything that might happen to your business. And if you're in a partnership with someone who might be broke uh, and you are really good and have some assets, they're going to come after you. Um, and that's happened, happened to a friend of mine's dad who was in a partnership with three people. Um, and he ended up going from, you know, uh, multi-million uh, dollar uh, business to, to virtually zero. Uh, and that's because his partners, uh, maybe they were good at hiding stuff, but they just didn't have um, the wealth. Now, it's because of those situations that comp uh, business, uh, businesses have lobbied against certain things, because there are, you know, partners that are, um, well, they might have some difficulties uh, with money, with other types of things. And so governments have been very creative. They've, uh, they've put together a bunch of hybrids. Uh, a hybrid basically is a form of business that combines the benefits of a corporation and the benefits of a partnership together. So you might have heard of an LLC, or an LLP, or even a PC. Um, basically, these are hybrids. They're corporations in terms of limited liability. However, they are taxed like partnerships at that lower individual rate. The corporate, uh, the corporate tax rate is 21%. That's where it starts. 
However, the individual tax rate is 10%. So when they talk about tax advantages, that's what they're talking about, is that if, you, if the company has a profit, you report that profit on your taxes, for a sole proprietor or a partnership, the tax rates start at 10% and go up. For a corporation, the tax rates start at 21% and go up. So that's a big one. One thing that's really important about a corporation um, is one is that ownership and management of the company is separate. That's not true for a sole proprietorship or a partnership. In a sole proprietorship, you're the owner and the manager. In a partnership, the general partners are owners and managers. What they, what they say goes. If you sell your sole proprietorship, you're done, right? It's someone else's business and it's someone else's rules. Partnerships can also change quite a bit. If you add a partner, your old partnership is done. You have a new partnership. So instead of having partnership A and B and you add a C, you are now, a partnership A and B stops. That business is done. You now have a new business, partnership ABC. And so that's really important. And let's say you want to add a D. Well, your partnership ABC is now done and a new partnership ABCD has started. And so that's really important to know. Partnership, once ownership changes in a partnership, everything changes in a partnership, <laughs> okay? Once ownership changes in a sole proprietorship, everything changes in the sole proprietorship. Uh, that's one of the advantages of a corporation. The ownership of a corporation and the management of the corporation are separate, okay? The owners of a corporation are called stockholders or shareholders. Corporations are broken into pieces called shares of ownership. Shares of ownership and stock is the same thing, okay? So if you say stockholder or shareholder, it's interchangeable terms. They mean the exact same thing. If you say shares of ownership or stock, they mean the same thing. They are exactly the same word. Um, so corporations have ownership that's broken into shares of ownership. Uh, the stockholders are the owners of a corporation. But unlike the other two forms, stockholders are not managers. The stockholders are represented by a board of, uh, of directors for the corporation who hire the upper management team to get things done for them. And so in a corporation, the ownership can change anytime, but the management of the company stays the same. And that provides a level of stability, and which is one of the reasons why a lot of corporations are quite, you know, they grow uh, quite large. Now, in this particular book, when we're talking about corporations, you've got to understand that there are two types of corporations, okay? Um, we are looking, this book focuses on what we call public corporations. And you have to excuse my, I'm writing with my finger here, which is really difficult to do. Um, that's different than private corporations. They're also private corporations. Um, once, a, once you become a corporation, let's say I'm Mike, uh, the dog walker, and I decide to incorporate. Um, well, and I get approved. So I'm Mike, the dog walker, Inc. Uh, I'm a private corporation, which means that the shares of ownership is private. Of course, I have all the shares of ownership, so it's quite private. No one else can be an owner because it's a private corporation. I have to invite them in with, by selling them shares of ownership, which I won't do, okay? Um, in a private corporation, all the information remains private. However, um, I might be growing and Mike the Dog Walker Inc. Uh, company might be doing quite well. And now I have people all across the country who wanna join a franchise or other types of part of being Mike the Dog Walker Inc. Um, and so I'm like, you know, I'm gonna grow my business. It's hard to grow my business privately, although I can do it. What I wanna do is I wanna raise a ton of money. I wanna raise a ton of money. And I have two ways to raise money. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna increase the number of shares of ownership that I have legally with the state. That costs money. And then I'm gonna to go to Wall Street and ask, to ask them to help me find investors to raise money, okay? Investment banks basically are the fundraisers 
of capitalism. They help corporations uh, raise money. Okay. Um, in this case, I'm raising money through ownership. So this is going to be an equity stake. Okay. You can also raise money by lending, which is what the bond market is uh, about. But in this case, we're going to focus on equity because that's stock. Um, well, there's two choices. They can say, okay, I have some private buyers. They want to keep the company private. And it's just going to be me and these investors that are going to own the company. And we'll get, I'll be raising my money that way. That's fine. That's a private placement. There's lots of private corporations out there. Um, one of the biggest ones that you might have heard of, um, because it's, it's really big, is called Bose Corporation. B-O-S-E. Bose makes um, lots of sound-related equipment, speakers and so forth. They're very, very big. It's a global corporation, but it's private, which means that you and I don't know any information about Bose because only the owners know. And since you and I are part of the public and we cannot be owners, it's none of our business. Now, probably one of the most um, famous private companies that probably never wanted to be this famous is the Trump Organization. Uh, the Trump Organization is a real estate corporation. It's a private corporation. The shares of ownership are owned by uh, Mr. Trump and his family members. Um, no one knows other than the stockholders uh, really how profitable uh, the Trump organization is, what their assets are, what they make, uh, what their profits are, etc. It's a private corporation and um, that's the structure of it. Uh, at one point in time, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg really didn't want to be a public company. He wanted to remain a private corporation, but he was convinced that it would be better to go public. So there's a lot of corporations that decide, look, what we really want to do is open up our ownership, shares of ownership to the public. And so public corporations are corporations in which you and I, as members of the public, can be a stockholder simply by buying a share of ownership through the stock market, through in the stock exchange. So in other words, all of the companies that are listed on the stock exchange are public corporations. They're public corporations because you and I, as members of the public, can be stockholders in them simply by purchasing a share or more of stock in them. That's different. We can't do that with private corporations because their stock is not available to the public. And that's another important thing. If it's a public corporation in which you and I can become owners, shareholders of, then the information of that corporation is also public, which is why we know for a fact how much revenue Walmart has or McDonald's has and how much profit Apple made and how many shares of ownership Jeff Bezos has in Amazon or Tim Cook has in Apple. We know that information because all of those companies are public corporations. You and I could easily be a stockholder of Walmart if we wanted to simply by buying a share of Walmart stock because it's a public corporation. And because it's public, the government requires all the financial information to be public. And that's where this book comes in. The accounting information that we're gonna be talking about is really uh, geared towards understanding the public corporation. Okay, and that's really the focus of this book. The focus of this book is learning about financial accounting that affects public corporations, information that you and I have available to us as members of the public. Okay, so that's important. That's a very big lecture for one slide. I'll be shorter on the others. <laughs> Any questions so far? Are we okay? All right, I'll take that as a good thing. Unless I, unless you all fell asleep on me, uh, then that's not a good thing. So this financial accounting information, right, 
uh, which is so important in the corporate structure, has users both inside the company and outside the company. So internal users of financial information include all types of departments within the company. Matter of fact, all the departments in the company will uh, need to understand the financial information. So obviously the folks in the finance and accounting departments need to know that. But even if you're interested in going into marketing someday, marketing needs to understand their role in financial information. Management also uses financial and accounting information all the time. It's how they make decisions. Okay. And of course, human resources uh, needs to understand obviously a lot of financial information because employees are um, critical to the success of the company. You got to hire the right people and you have to afford them. And then benefits are really expensive as well, uh, particularly healthcare. So let me take a, a quick peek at these and tell you why some of these departments need to know uh, accounting information. Uh, that's important. So Mark, I'm going to start with marketing because in marketing here, um, they talk about price. And uh, so those of you who might have had a marketing class in the past, you probably know about the four P's, right? Price, product, placement, and promotion. Um, well, the price is really critical in marketing because the prices you that anyone charges, in this case, Apple charges for a phone, for example, $1,000 for a phone is pretty outrageous for most people. So why, why would someone pay $1,000 for a phone? Well, that's really what marketing's job is, is to support the price that the price points that the company has set. The prices that you and I pay, so when you and I go into an Apple store and we buy that phone for $1,000, or we buy a MacBook Air, or we buy something else, whatever we give that company when they sell us something is revenue to them. And revenue is everything to all businesses. Revenue is the, uh, is from the prices that they charge for the things that they sell. And I need you to understand just critically, revenue is everything to any organization. If they don't sell something and make that money, there's no way to pay their bills and there's no way to have a profit. Revenue is the source of all of that. From the revenue, companies pay their expenses and from the revenue, what's left over is their profit, okay? So revenue is critical to all companies. And revenue is simply uh, the prices that they are selling their goods for, okay? So like I said, Apple has a very high price structure. That's what they've determined as the best thing. They want to uh, be associated with top quality. And so they say, yeah, it's worth a thousand dollars because there's nothing else like an iPhone. Okay, um, marketing's job is to support that. Walmart has decided on a totally different strategy, right? They've decided always low prices is really what they uh, what they want to what they want to market. I think that's what they're known for, right? Well, again, they've decided on a different strategy. Low prices means that for every item they sell at Walmart they're gonna be collecting less revenue, right? Um, well, that revenue still has to do the same job. It still has to pay all their bills. And it has to, there's gonna be something left over for the profit, okay? So from revenue, and this is important and you'll see this a lot more, businesses will pay all their expenses. And I'm just gonna put EXP here because I just can't stand writing with my finger. And what's left from the revenue, minus all those expenses, is the profit. In accounting, profit is called net income. And again, I apologize for writing with my finger, but I have no choice. I don't have one of those pens, okay? So net income is the profit of a company. And net income comes from revenue. 
Revenue has to cover all the expenses of a business and there's gotta be some left over for a profit, okay? I think I have a question here, let me see. Yes, look, they, they do, uh, they are the largest uh, retailer that we have. Um, let, me, let me just give you an example of how different the strategy is. So like I said, Apple um, sells their iPhones for about $1,000. So if you look at Apple, you'll see that for every iPhone they sell, they're collecting $1,000 in revenue. Well, believe it or not, the expenses that Apple has, so this is all the expenses to produce the iPhone, to sell the iPhone, to have all those stores, to pay all those employees, to do all that other stuff. Uh, the expenses eat up $800 of that $1,000. And the net income that Apple has roughly from every cell phone is about 200 bucks. So that's a very, very large profit on $1,000 on one item, okay? Um, and that's why Apple is a very um, good company. They're a highly profitable company. Walmart has the opposite problem, right? They've decided always low prices. And so for every dollar you give Walmart, okay, you know, that dollar that you give Walmart when you buy something is their revenue. They have a little over 97 cents of expenses to pay from that dollar, leaving roughly about two to three cents profit out of every dollar. Now, you might say that's not much. Well, it's not much, but the issue is, as Nick pointed out, Walmart has over a half a trillion dollars in sales. I'll repeat that, it's a half a trillion. Yeah, we're, we're up to the T's now. Um, and so that's a lot of pennies on every dollar, and that adds up. So they are also a relatively profitable company once you take into consideration everything that they do, okay? Um, so this is important. You'll, this is something that you're gonna learn over and over and over again in this class. This is basically the income statement, um, but it's critical because everything is based on, everything depends on revenue. No revenue, no nothing else. Is, nothing else is going on in their, anyone's life, in the company's life. Um, management also uses financial information for damn good reasons. They have to make decisions. Okay. So we have situations today where because of um, uh, the surge of online, you have a lot of stores who, uh, a lot of companies who are closing retail stores. I don't think this is the end of retail. I just think there's a surplus of retailers. And since more people are shopping online and less in person, there's just less need to have all those stores. So companies have to figure out which stores to keep and which stores to close. And you're seeing that uh, in the news all the time. How does management do that? Well, basically, let's go back to this. Stores are also looked at as profit centers. Am I making a profit from this store? Um, so what makes a company uh, management decide they're going to close the Poughkeepsie store and keep you know, the White Plains store open? Well, they're going to look at, well, what type of revenue is coming in? What does the store sell for us? How much does it cost us to keep that store open? And is there a profit coming in from that particular store? And in many cases, if there's not a profit, they're gonna say, well, why do I wanna keep a store open? That costs me more money to keep open than I, than I make from it. Let's close it. Let's just consolidate, close that store, keep this other store open because we're still making money. And I think that's basically what you've been seeing in the news, but it's race, basically speaking here, it's what, uh, financial information is used for. Management needs to understand that financial information to make better decisions. Uh, same thing with, in this case, your book mentions product lines. You have big companies that make lots of different products. Uh, how do they decide uh, which product line should be shut down? Well, they're gonna look at the same financial information. Well, what's selling? Are we selling this particular product? Is it a profitable product for us? Uh, or every time we try to sell it, we can't? Um, and it ends up at, you know, one of those discount houses or something or on sale clearance. Um, so they decide too from the financial information, is this product line profitable for us? And if not, they might decide to shut it down. Um, human resources also has to look at financial information all the time because 
Yeah, you know, it's one thing to think that employees are expenses. They are. They're a major expense. Um, however, you need employees to get things done. You know, you just need you know, people to get things done. So some employees are going to be a little bit more valuable to uh, the company, more profitable for the company than others. And so this is where the pay structure comes in. You know, if I'm hiring you uh, and you want to make a good salary, then you're going to need to produce more revenue for me. You're going to have to be one of the reasons my company is profitable. And so oftentimes the salaries that are provided to people in companies may be directly related to, you know, how profitable their particular position is for the company. Is it generating revenue or is it helping limit expenses? Is it, is it adding to the profitability of the company? And some jobs do that quite well. Those are the higher paying jobs. Uh, some jobs don't do that as well. Those will be the lower paying jobs. Um, and so companies have to structure that, but they know how important human resources are and they know how important people are to getting things done. Uh, everybody contributes to the profitability of the company. It's just that some employees contribute more, and so they'll get more. Um, and of course, if you're in finance and you don't know accounting, you're in trouble. There are folks on the outside of the company, external users, that also use financial information. Now again, these are public companies, but even if they weren't public companies, if they were private, <laughs> there are still some external users. The most common external users are your lenders. Creditors are lenders. So anyone who needs a loan, and most businesses borrow money, either short-term or long-term, um, are gonna need to deal with a creditor, okay? It's people that give loans. Um, and creditors are not just banks. Uh, they're, they're suppliers, um, they're investors. Investors can also be creditors because the bond market uh, is basically where investors go to lend money. Um, so creditors, it's a broad category and you should look at it that way. Anyone who lends you money is a creditor. Okay. Creditors are not in the business of lending you money and not getting it back. The purpose of their business is to lend you money and get it back with interest and make a profit from doing business with you. And so they're very interested in your financial information because they want to make sure that if they give you this loan, you're, going to, you're able to pay it back because your ability to pay it back means profits for them, okay? So they're going to need to know your financial information. As a matter of fact, if anyone here has ever went for a loan, you understand that. You've had to provide financial information to your lender, to your creditor, in order to get approved for the loan because they want to make sure you can pay it back. That's their business. Their, their business is profitable when you pay the loan back. So this financial information is, of course, very, very critical. And of course, is investors is listed twice here, I guess maybe because they're twice as important or have twice as many questions, I'm not sure. Um, but investors wanna know the financial information because they're very interested in investing in profitable companies. They know that if, you, if they invest in a company and it becomes more and more profitable over time, their investment grows. In other words, they start making uh, capital gains and that's exactly why people invest. Uh, where do you find a company's financial information? Um, good question. There, uh, well, I mean, the financial information is available on almost all of the investment websites. So if you go to even Yahoo Finance or CNN Money or CNBC and put in a stock, um, there'll be links to all of that. The government has um, uh, a system called Edgar, which uh, collects all the financial information for every company that's there. Uh, and I'll be introducing you to those uh, things in chapter two a little bit more. Um, okay, so let me continue here. Just some in specific information on, uh, on those departments. Well, I'm not here to teach you uh, ethics, God knows. Um, we have learned from a young age, uh, the difference between right and wrong. You learned even in before kindergarten, don't take things that are not yours. <laughs> um, you've learned how important it is to be honest and truthful and trustworthy. Uh, we all have had these experiences and we all basically have very similar 
ethical backgrounds. Unfortunately, that is not like uh, that is not as as common as it is right now. Well, I think you you but you do learn, Adam. As you know, you learn ethics from uh, from your family. If you go to yeah, church, I, synagogue, I mosque. If you go, if you you learn ethics from you know, from the media, from school, from all types of groups. If you yeah, are but uh, the problem is that there's not a lot of honesty in, in the world as of right now, so. Okay, I understand, yeah. Um, we all know uh, the difference. Sadly, uh, what happens is that financial information is so critical um, to the function of the capitalist society, to the capital markets that it has to be um, as honest as humanly possible, okay? Accounting information and financial information needs to be as honest and humanly possible because you have creditors lending money based on this financial information. You have investors investing money based on this financial information, okay? Um, and I think that means the financial information needs to be damn good. If you wanna keep faith in the markets, you have to make sure the information is good. Otherwise you lose your investors. And that means you have no capital system. So financial scandals uh, that have happened in the past and may still be happening, um, thankfully they're few and far between. But when they do happen, they've been, they've been big. <laughs> Enron, WorldCom, AIG, um, basically lied about financial information. Um, they, in many cases, reported much higher revenue and profits than they actually had. Uh, they hid debts uh, and expenses from investors, making them look financially stronger. Um, and they were, they were caught. Uh, Madoff is a little bit of a different story. Uh, we can talk about him later. Um, yeah, Ponzi schemes are a little bit different, but we will, I can show you that uh, in time. Um, it got to the point where Congress actually acted, and you know it takes like the earth practically ending for Congress to do anything. Um, so Congress actually acted because uh, even our government understands how important the financial markets are to capitalism. Um, and so they passed something called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. We call it SOX um, for short. And basically for the very, very first time, and this was back, back when George W. Bush was president, first was elected president, um, so you know, 2000, early 2000s, this was passed. And basically for the very, very first time, um, corp corporate executives and the boards of directors need to sign financial reports saying that to their knowledge they're truthful with penalties of perjury and jail time associated if they're lying. And so for the very, very first time, executives and folks in high places can go to jail for lying about financial information when dealing with investors. Okay. And that came courtesy of Congress, which was weird because at this time, uh, George W. Bush is a, was a Republican, and Congress uh, at this time, um, the Senate was Republican. So actually having them do anything that is uh, clamping down on businesses is difficult to do. But these situations were extreme, and they needed to act. Okay. So for the very first time, they can go to jail. There's some other types of things that we'll be learning about um, as we go through Accounting 101 and 102 with the SOX Act. Matter of fact, chapter seven has more detail on this. Um, and so basically those are the things on ethics. Uh, again, the do it exercise that I pointed out at the end of learning objective one is also part of this slideshow. So no problems there as well.